welcome to Think Tech. I'm Crystal here. Long time no see. I'm back today for a special episode highlighting uh, the International Film Festival here in Hawaii, HIF, with a particular emphasis on VR. What's VR? Virtual reality. Well, it's apparently a huge kind of up and coming thing, and Taiwan has become the forefront of this. And so I have a really special guest here today who flew in literally yesterday, last night, uh, to present her work and to present this VR world here at the festival. So with no further ado, let me welcome our guest, uh, Estella. Let me do it right. Estella Valdivieso. I did it wrong. Valdivieso Chen. <laughs> Sorry. So Estella, you are part Bolivian, part Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. What an interesting combination. I'm sure you get it a lot, but not to dilute that um, uh, that idea of cross-cultural mixing and how that's influenced you. Can we start there? Like, what's sure. your upbringing and yeah, what's uh, your all about? My, my late father is Bolivian, my mom is Taiwanese, and I'm born and raised in Taiwan. Okay. Uh, but, um, you know, with a Latino dad, you kind of have that uh, really outgoing personality that kind of make me a little bit, just a little bit different from, you know. <laughs> yeah, just, a <laughs> just a little bit different. I think a lot different. You come across <laughs> as being, yeah, it's very, very, yeah. Um, so, tell me about your dad. Like, what did he end up in Taiwan for any particular reason? How did they meet? Yeah, my dad used to work for Bolivian government at the time. Like, when he and my mom met, he came to Taiwan. He was like um, uh, doing like a like a delegation for uh, this country, and they were like still um, um, you know diplomatic um, connection between the two countries at the time. So like ah. that, that, that visit was quite often, and that's how he met my mom in Taiwan. What was your mom doing? <laughs> my mom was a college girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cute. Okay. Yeah, she was studying. She, her, uh, she was a major in English, so she was like, you know, very keen to be helpful to foreigners. <laughs> and so, you know, so, you know, it's just like one of those romance stories that it happened is. on a bus. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sounds like a film itself. I know. Have you so not fun. done anything, a story on your kind no, of No, but background? I love talking about it. I love finding out little clues about it. There's yeah. the mom's version, the dad's version, and then my, my cousin's version from all the way in Bolivia. When I visit them, they, they tell me a whole different version ah. of how, how, they, like, how the romance continues. So it's really interesting to kind of learn about your parents' story from yeah. different plates, from you different angles. You should do angle. something with that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we're talking about cinema and the art, art yeah. form of framing, and what you just said, it, it brings these kind of interesting concepts of like interpretations yeah. and storytelling, and whose version do you listen to, and yeah. how do you frame it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and you kind of embody um, this multicultural space. So, do you use that in your work? Tell us about your work. So uh, I come from feature film background. Um, I study I study film, and uh, also uh, my company also develops like a TV series and now virtual reality. The way that um, we select projects or the projects that we want to do are mostly projects that can speak to um, you know audiences from different places, but with that strong uh, Asian identity. We want to kind of explore what Asian identity nowadays means mm. uh, because there is a lot of like, you know, a stereotypical way of thinking what Asians are, what Taiwanese are. And uh, I think that um, with the stories nowadays, we can, it can be much more. Mm. And we can realize that uh, even though certain stories come from, maybe come from Taiwan, maybe some ritual from Taiwan, but the, the essence of it is very similar and can connect to anywhere in the world. Like when you come into like your spiritual temple sucks, the spiritual aspect, how does that reflect in different culture and how do they connect to it? That's kind of how we um, select projects that we are interested in producing, like finding that uh, essence in it. Yeah, essence is a good word. Um, and it kind of links to your idea of exploring spirituality in VR because VR space is a very spiritual space. It's a very uh, dystopian space, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have to put on these these goggles and you go into this different world. Do you think there's a trend for this because people are searching for out of reality kind of experiences or to go outside of their own normal lives to live something a little bit more I, I interesting? Think so. I think that uh, how, how media has developed is very much that, you know, with cinema, with wanting to go to mm. a movie on the weekend, like once a week or yeah. uh, every other week with your boyfriend, with your family. Yeah. That's to get you out of your usual 
like you know routines and then with now people are you know streaming all the time um, you know binge watching and yeah. all this is you trying to get out of that um, like the re reality that you have and have creating a another version of reality for yourself and that's kind of how we um, proceed like thinking that maybe a virtual reality will have its place for uh, the future narrative as well because that's how uh, we have that habit and that kind of interest of exploring mm. uh, what's the, the alternative version of yourself. Alternative version of yourself. Wow. Yeah. So for people who aren't really familiar with this VR world, how would you explain it to them? And how are we supposed to approach it or experience this? Um, my favorite way to explain it is always uh, memory. Mm. So I like to say virtual reality is like creating a version of mem memory that you have because you are putting on a headset, you are seeing a world, a, a creator, a storyteller create for you. It could be game or it could be narrative. Right, it could, it's a very wide spectrum, but okay. you are in there with a headset, exploring it. Uh, like you're in that room yeah, with those you, characters. Yeah, you feel like you are in a different space. Yeah. And um, if it's it's game, you have more interactivity, you have right. more choice. But then there, this, the, the spectrum goes to even just a 360 video. And maybe you don't have that interactivity, but you still have the choice of uh, being attracted by certain, uh, uh, certain performance and you look in, into different directions. Yeah. That all creates a level of um, memory. So uh, your version of watching, for example, your spiritual temple sucks, right. and my version would be different because huh. we'll probably be seeing different information as a story uh, story world uh, has. But doesn't that story guide you to look for certain things? It will. I, th uh, I, I think that a lot of storytellers uh, in virtual reality create a, a space that uh, you don't have to see every single thing. Okay. You, you, you put in a lot of Easter eggs, you put in a, a story, basically building a story world uh -huh. so for the audience to have the, the space to explore it. Okay. And um, and maybe even revisit sometimes, you know, this time watching it, you see this and you feel this way. But maybe the next time you watch it, you will you find different, you have to pick up different things. Yeah. There would be a level of guidance, but that guidance is not strict. It's not like okay. in films that you got the storyboard, you got the frame to frame, that we are very um, um, systematic of how we want you to right. uh, re like receive the information. Yeah, interesting. Why why that title? Why that title? Mm. Well, it comes in. T I think it, it matches the attitude because like we actually had a very serious title at the beginning, uh -huh. and then uh, after the very first draft, we were like, oh. We should have something that's a little bit, you know, more challenging the audience because right. uh, the narrative itself. We're aiming for. Um, uh, comedy. We want people to laugh with it. We want people to kind of uh, um, imagine like they go to this uh, virtual reality, spiritual world, mm. and uh, thinking that they can fix something at the beginning, but then everything start falling apart while you fix it. Yeah. So that's why we get. You know, that's why okay. it's called. You no, spiritual it's very temple funky, sense. and you can see the, the the pace of it and the music and everything just escalates into this like very kind of fun, crazy world. Unrealistic, but perhaps there are things that people can pull out that can apply to them. Is yeah. that what you can yeah. say about that? Yeah, that's, that's what we're aiming for. So like, um, I'm not sure if you know of this ritual. It's like a Taoist ritual. It's called the blindfolding ritual. So uh, it's a very uh, famous ritual in Taiwan that people uh, get blindfolded with this red clothes and then there will be a Taoist monk uh -huh. uh, guiding you to go to the spiritual world to either visit your lost family, people that you want to see but or want to say goodbye to, or go to your spiritual temple so you can remodel it. Uh -huh. And you can change it and make your real life a better place. So if you have a problem like in career, in marriage, or right. anything, you can go to your spiritual temple. You'll take you to your bedroom and fix it. And so if you tidy up your room a little bit, hopefully your love life will be a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. You say, oh, maybe it's because your window is by is by. Oh, like, that's like a feng you, shui thing. Yeah, like a feng shui thing, but it's in your spiritual temple. Okay. Okay. So that's what we learned about it, and uh -huh. we found it very uh, fascinating yeah. because it has that same uh, uh, like. 
feeling like it's like virtual reality, exactly. right? Exactly. You're yeah. putting on something and taking you somewhere else. Ah. That's the exact same ritual of virtual reality. That's very cool. So, uh, your spiritual temple sex was our very first VR work. Yeah. And uh, we wanted to find something that, you know, we have fun with and something that we can connect to. Right. And that's what we approach with it. But then at the same time, even though that ritual uh, only exists probably, I think, only in Taiwan, I asked a lot of people uh, different places in Asia, they don't know about the ritual. So I, saw, I think it's a very okay. Taiwanese okay. Um, ritual. But it doesn't matter because, it doesn't. Yeah, because it's very much something that um, people from everywhere in the world has that imagination right. of say, I wish I can go somewhere and fix my trouble and you know yeah. everything can be managed just by remodeling. It's interesting you say that because just um, just glancing through the uh, different selections of the VR uh, films that are presented at HIF this year, there are a lot of things that do deal with memory. One of them um, called After Image for Tomorrow mm -hmm. also explores choosing three uh, memories mm -hmm. that uh, that you can preserve, but then you have to question whether you can trust them. So that's kind of like going into a very more abstract and deeper tangent. Mm -hmm. um, there's one by the U.S. called Asteroids, which mm -hmm. is a comedy of deep space. So it's mm -hmm. a different kind of virtuality. Bodyless is also by Taiwan. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Yeah. Lending digital storytelling um, by following an elderly political uh, prisoner mm -hmm. who's passed and where he goes from there and it turns digital. So mm -hmm. the abstractness of, of that reality, yeah. of that afterworld being kind of synonymous with this digital kind of virtual space. Um, really fascinating stuff. Um, so I think... You know, as we dwell or, or as people can slowly absorb the concept of this, do we have things that can kind of hook them into wanting to um, try this experience? Is it for young people? Is it for like, is there like a target audience? I think um, it's very broad though, because okay. the fact that uh, virtual reality, the way the storytellers are in virtual reality have different backgrounds. You know, we have uh, like like your spiritual temple is from uh, a, a film director, but then at the same time you got digital artists, you got people from theater space, performers. Oh yeah, there's a dance one. Yeah, the, the from they, Australia. Yeah. Right. So there is uh, it's a it's a media that so many artists from different space are coming into it. So people ask, um, you know, if you have different interests, you, you will gather all of them into this space. Cool. And then uh, age-wise as well, every, like, you know, for your spiritual temple success, obviously comedy is very right. uh, funny, but then uh, I've shown it to my grandmother. Yeah. But also I have an audience of like 30 uh, high school kids watching and That's laughing. That's great. So this includes yeah. all of you out there. So if you're interested, um, we're going to take a short break, but we come back and we're going to talk more about this virtual reality world and how HIF is offering all this opportunity to go and watch it. So stay tuned. Thanks to our Think Tech underwriters and grand tours, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Mun Lee and the Friends of Think Tech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Dwayne Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Welcome back to Quok Talk here on Think Tech. I'm Crystal, and we are talking to Estella about the virtual reality world, the beauty, the abstractness, the concepts of memory that you can play with in VR. Um, so we just saw a clip of your film. Uh, and that's just one of many projects that you do. And let's talk a little bit about kind of the production, because people don't know, like, how do you distinguish VR with regular cinema? Um, like, is the budget kind of much smaller? Are concepts of lighting and storytelling, you know, how, how, do, how does it differentiate? Um, I think that VR, there's so many different uh, um, genre or, let's say, a way of approaching it. Um, like, for example, for your spiritual temple sex is live action. So uh, you have real actor in the space, and then um, 
you add and then you add graphics to it so that you okay. create a, a virtual space but um, in that sense you know the production mainly is focusing on shooting right so it's very much um, a l kind of like traditional uh, filmmaking right. how do you like organize your production in that sense but then the difficult part is probably uh, to avoid uh, too many things that you have to stitch together because you're having 360 cameras so how do you shoot it and still be able to set up the lighting like basically ah. all the tools that you use to know um, not necessarily exist has or will yeah. be there so how do you solve that problem in post-production or even in production. Mm. That's the part when it's uh, difficult for live action. Right. But um, with live action, there is still a limitation because it's still a free degree of freedom experience. You can only see like 360 and up and down. Yeah. Um, there are also the spectrum of uh, creating more freedom for your audiences that you can provide them a, a six degree of freedom so you can walk in and out, like, you know, really wow. get closer to the character. So a lot of animation works are done that way. Uh, and now animation virtual reality and actually we are working on that right now and realize that there are uh, even more uh, technical uh, things that yeah. uh, you need to figure out along the way it's not completely um, uh, just using the animation production pipeline you actually also have to uh, think about the interactivity before the animation right. how do you uh, create and draw a map of interactivity to make sure that your audience really can get what you are guiding them to do. Right. And you're working with different dimensions, right? Yeah. I mean, you're talking live action, animation, yeah. graphics, and yeah. It's yeah, it's, it's a lot, and, and every project, the, uh, the projects that we do, we, are, we try different things in every project because we want to see how the, the media uh, can do in different fields with yeah. different kind of artists. But um, they are more and more uh, mixed genre as well, like uh, some, some documentary work that mixes um, some uh, mixes live action and animation to tell the narrative that they want to tell. Right. So that uh, is, is a field with different possibilities. Yeah. yeah, it sounds really endless the way you're saying it. But in terms of production, is it more expensive, less expensive? More I would say uh, it's relatively, but it, it would definitely you definitely have to consider the part of. Uh, because it's a new technology yes. so there is a lot of uh you know r d that you gotta do you gotta research you gotta you gotta develop and okay. you gotta you know um and, and that's very costly they tend to be shorter yeah. shorter films right because yeah. is it because of our attention with something that's just so highly stimulating or is it just because of the budgets often i or? think uh, it's all all this so okay. you got the budget you can't do something right. that's really high production value but super long but at the same time uh, we also notice that a lot of audience, um, uh, most of them, uh, around 20 to 30 minutes, a lot of times they it's want to, to breathe. Also, the hardware is still not you know, as light as we mm. hope yet, and that oh, we're I getting see. there. It's a physical <laughs> but, issue. Then, yeah, like, also that, that you know, right. having a headset here yeah. and heavy, but then at the same time, you know, sometimes you, you, you lose track of time. For me, I'm like losing track of time because I'm in love with the medium now. Right. So uh, you, you get, I, I get to be in there longer. But for you know, new audience, young yeah. audience, they, they are still that. trying to figure out how they use the, the device okay. and how, how long time they can be there. Is there a danger in over um, immersing yourself in VR world? No, I don't think so, unless you are putting on a headset in public space and walking through well, the traffic. Well, you know, it's like kids who do gaming and yeah. then they lose touch with what their, their real world should be. Um, you know, in that way, do you think that there, that some people might just go so deep into this other world that they don't really have a grasp on their own? They can't pull yeah. back and have the simplicity of what's natural. Well, that's why we do uh, storytelling, because when you're using storytelling, to using this media to do storytelling, you're also reflecting on it. Yeah, and a lot of the work that you've, uh, you probably see even in HIV is that there are work that's also uh, trying to uh, understand what virtual reality means yeah. and uh, what's your relationship with uh, virtual reality. And I think that uh, storytelling helps people understand how to cope with it. And oh. you have to be participating and actually be part of it in order to know how much you use is healthy. It's the same thing like internet. Or you know, gaming when it came out, uh, online gaming that a lot of kids are yes. yeah you, spending a lot of time with. Yeah. But we only learn by actually participating. Mm. That's what I 
<laughs> and is there an engaging aspect of this presentation? I think there is. Um, so there's a HIF has a VR lounge, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it starts when the, the ninth. Mm -hmm. In Salt, it starts on the eighth, actually, from the eighth to the twelfth. And then there's an entrepreneur sandbox, which is a very new space, also in Salt in Kakaako, uh, from the ninth to the twelfth. And I think I, I the setup, I, as I understand, is that there are a lot of different, um, not booths, but just spaces for people to put on the glasses and you can watch whatever you want to watch. Is that right? Yeah. And then are there panel discussions and people being able to talk to filmmakers like yourself? Yeah. Who can so uh, I think one of the cool part of our virtual reality is because everybody has their own individual experience. Yeah. And the first thing that people want to do when it comes to you have a good memory, you want to share that good memory. You want to share what you experience. Okay. So that's why the launch is there. When people, oh. you know, after they watch it, and you know, if you have that space, people can get to meet each other. You can ex you can talk, and some of the work is interactive. Maybe even uh, with more than one person at a time, you actually get to meet interesting people or good friends in those kind of environment as well. It's very sociable, more sociable than a lot of people imagine when they say, okay. oh, you just right. put it on a headset for yourself. Right. I think creating a virtual space definitely uh, create that social uh, possibility. And also, the panel is great. They're, they're bringing a lot of uh, uh, people with different experience. I, I'm, I'm very much interested myself to listen to other people's experience to see how we can bring this uh, media, this new media storytelling to another, uh, another stage. Right, and another way of bringing this to another stage is uh, you mentioned before off camera is co-productions. The uh, mm -hmm. concept of bringing different countries and different places and cultures together. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. um, how are you doing that, and why is that important? Um, so um, for the second VR project that I did is called Mechanical Souls. It's a Taiwan and French co-production oh. uh, project. And the reason that we aim for a co-production for our second VR is we want to uh, bring the conversation of uh, sharing resources. I'm all the way in Taiwan, uh, and, the, and, and they are, uh, the French, uh, French, French ecosystem for VR has been developed for five years. How do we work together to uh, fill the gap of experience, right? Mm -hmm. So, and also resources, uh, also approaching that different territory and, and reaching out to those audience that you usually don't get to reach. Yeah. So you, when you have co-producers that's creatively uh, participating, then they will be able to provide you that information from that different territory audience too. So like when we were talking about earlier saying like, we want to do work, maybe it has a uh, uh, cultural identity yes. in it, but how do we still do work that not only uh, have that cultural identity, but also connect to people from different places. So we need to know how people understand the story as well. So when you have right. co-producer, there's that. And of course, la last and not the least is financing. So <laughs> you, it's always difficult to only finance uh, within your own territory. And, uh, and uh, there's limitation of uh, public grants even in Taiwan. And there is public grants in France or different places in Canada as well. Mm -hmm. How do we bring these financial resources together to create something that also with the fact that we are already we have our own access to our own audience, mm -hmm. then that means is uh, it's a project that can be distributed to different right. territory. So that's kind of why that we uh, kind of shifted uh, from your spiritual temple sucks that's all made in Taiwan, uh -huh. slowly shifted into um, a more uh, international co-production as right. aspect. Yeah, and like you said, you're bringing in not just the support from both sides, is the cultural context that you can bring onto the table. Mm -hmm. And that's important because I think like in our world, even though social media has kind of um, broken down all the so-called uh, boundaries of how we connect, there's still lots of pockets of misunderstandings and ignorance and you know by doing co-productions you open up that space and mm -hmm. and learn to have context to everything we look at mm -hmm. right and you talked about being actively participating in something like that VR is an active thing yeah. um, you don't just sit back and watch it with yeah. some popcorn I guess you can't really eat popcorn you're watching VR can you it's not like uh, that kind of thing I, think, <laughs> so, I, I have I have seen people with a bottle of, a, a, a bottle of beer okay. and watching it okay. <laughs> not recommended right. because I, I actually uh, like when I got my first headset, uh -huh. I had a cup of tea by my table. Uh -huh. I splash it on my computer, so oh. not recommended. Because <laughs> you're in a different world. And you yeah, can't just like, like you know. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. it's crazy because it really just opens up a whole different dimension. Yeah. And a few days, I mean, a few years ago, it was like 
What? We are, and now it's here. It's very exciting. I, every year, twice a year actually, HIF has these amazing films that we can see here. You know, I miss seeing Asian films, and being in Hawaii, I see more Asian films than I had when I lived previously in Hong Kong. It's just such a fabulous opportunity. I hope you all go on the HIF um, website, HIFF.org, because it has all, it's very clearly mapped out the different films, the different categories. There's a highlight on Japanese films, Chinese films, VR, and it's just like, it's, it's very, workable and so please support it and go and see films and fulfill yourself and enrich yourself is there anything else like your kind of takeaways for our audience to kind of leave lingering about this virtual world or no explore have fun yeah <laughs> well, are you going yeah. to explore i mean yeah, you're here for, sure. for this too yeah i'm going to be binge binge watching <laughs> should, VR, right? binge VR. what about just a plug for women like how do we increase the space for women in the film industry well, actually, uh, in virtual in virtual world, there is a lot of female uh, oh. storytellers and uh, uh, creators, and that was it's, it's it's such a new space, so it's very welcoming. And, okay. And uh, so yeah, I've been having a great fun talking, like working with a lot of um, uh, talents. Well, female Estella, talents. you are that embodying talent <laughs> and uh, international and virtual space. So thank you so much for sharing all your work. Good luck with the festival screenings, and thank go you. watch their films. Thank you.